Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Jenny Terman, and I'm Associate Professor of History and Affiliate Faculty Member of the Center for Appalachian Studies here at UVA WISE. I'm pleased to welcome all of you to the second of four talks we're going to have on the history and legacy of the Battle of Blair Mountain. So just a couple of quick housekeeping points before we get started. Um, to keep everybody safe, please keep your masks up while inside this room, uh, and also remember to silence your cell phones. Um, at the end of the talk, we're going to have uh, a Q&A session. Um, we'll be accepting those in person and through Zoom for those of you who are joining remotely. Um, we also have free Battle of Blair Mountain commemorative brochures available at the entrance. Uh, you're welcome to take one as you leave. So today's talk is going to be followed by two additional lectures. Professor Rebecca Bailey, author of Matewan Before the Massacre, will come to campus on October 13th. And then Professor TRC Hutton, author of Bloody Breath It, Politics and Violence in Appalachian South, will speak on the Baldwin Feltz Mine Guard System on November 17th. So I have some thanks to offer. I'd like to thank UVA WISE's lecture committee and our provost, Dr. Tricia Folds Bennett, for their generous financial support for this speaker series. Without them, of course, this event is not gonna be possible. I'd also like to recognize Drs. Brian McKnight and Amy Clark Spain at the Center for Appalachian Studies for their assistance with this, Tabitha Smith at the Center for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, UVA WISE's Media Services, the Department of History and Philosophy, and especially the Blair 100 Planning Committee and Mackenzie New at the West Virginia Mine Wars Museum for contributing their time, money, and energy to making this event possible. I also have to thank uh, our speaker for <laughs> attending some meeting, planning meetings with me as well. So for those of you unfamiliar with the Battle of Blair Mountain, the very, very short version uh, is that between August and early September 1921, Miners in the Southern West Virginia coal fields seeking to unionize so that they might improve deplorable working and living conditions organized what became the largest labor uprising in the United States and the largest armed conflict since the Civil War. The event had ripple effects throughout the central Appalachian coal fields and played a significant role in the eventual recognition of the rights of workers to unionize. Yet the legacy of Blair Mountain is not simple and clear cut it's through the commemorative events that have taken place in multiple states over the last month and here at UVA WISE through the speaker series that we're discovering more about the event itself, circumstances leading up to the battle and the battle's broader impact on Appalachia's and America's social, economic and political landscape. So our speaker today is no stranger to UVA WISE. Mr. Lloyd Tomlinson is an alumnus who hails from Lee County, Virginia he received his Bachelor of Arts degree from here in 2012 and then continued his studies at George Mason University, where he completed his master's degree in history in 2015. He's currently a PhD candidate in history at West Virginia University. His doctoral fields include Appalachian, 20th century US, public and world history, and he's well on his way to completing his dissertation titled The Stenega Coal and Coke Company Since the New Deal under the direction of Drs. Ken Phones wolf and Jessica Wilkerson. Mr. Tomlinson is published in West Virginia History and has received funding for his research from WVU's Department of History and the Henry Balin DuPont Research Grant at the Hagley Museum and Library in Wilmington, Delaware. He's also conducted internships with the National Coal Heritage Area Authority in West Virginia and at the Hagley, both of which I expect will serve him well in preparing him for the future. Finally, I should note that the Department of History and Philosophy and the Center for Appalachian Studies here at UVA WISE are very excited uh, that we got to welcome Mr. Tomlinson as a colleague this fall. He's been teaching an Introduction to Appalachian Studies class. So with that, please welcome Mr. Tomlinson who will offer his thoughts on the ways that coal operators in our own region of Southwest Virginia responded to news about Blair Mountain. Thank you, Jenny, for that uh, glowing introduction. I'm gonna stick back here behind the splash guard uh, for a little bit. I like to wander a little bit, um, but because of the mask getting really, really humid, I can't always do that anymore. So the sooner we're over this, the more untethered I shall be from the podium. Um, you may be asking yourself, what in the world does the Stenega Coke and Coal Company, what in the world does Wise County have to do with the Battle of Blair Mountain? And to that, I, wanna, I want you to sort of think about 
the forms that violence and especially violence involving um, labor management relations can take. A lot of the history of Appalachia has focused on West Virginia and Kentucky, particularly um, the labor history of Appalachia. And for good reason, you have these defining, almost sensational events, the Bla Battle of Blair Mountain, Bloody Harlan, that are really important turning points in Appalachian and American history. Um, they are certainly definitive um, incidents, but the history of industrial development and the history of labor in Appalachia is much more complicated than those um, than uh, those scenarios. Violence can take a lot more subtle um, forms than marching 5,000 miners against the Logan County Sheriff's deputies and mine guards and Virginia, West Virginia State Police and um, almost getting bombed by an airplane. Instead, it can look like creating dependent systems. Instead, it can look like um, indoctrination and um, convincing people to choose one side or over the other. Um, that can take on a specific type of violence on its own. And while that is certainly present in the history of the Stenega Coke and Coal Company, as well as um, really coal operations all throughout Appalachia, um, I think it's also important to look at um, it from a look at the coal operators from the standpoint of welfare capitalism. And the Stenega Coke and Coal Company makes for a very, very thorough case study of welfare capitalism and how it evolves over the course of the 20th century. Um, because of how they employed welfare capitalism, what they called contentment sociology, the Stenega Coke and Coal Company managed to avoid a lot of the labor strife that accompanied the union push in West, Southern West Virginia and Eastern Kentucky. And in fact, didn't really see the union gain a foothold in their collieries until about 1933. Um, contentment sociology did not on its own accomplish this. Um, to be sure, the company used a lot of the same coercive um, methods that um, their neighbors used but they were also attuned to what was going on elsewhere in the industry, um, particularly in Logan County and in Southern West Virginia more broadly, and perhaps more immediately in Harlan County, Kentucky. So when the UMW, when the United Mine Workers finally do get a foothold in, um, in the Senega Coke and Coal Company in 1933, both management and the union sort of have to learn how to work together and avoid the bloodshed that had accompanied those earlier union drives. Um, and neither wanted a bloody Harlan scenario to play out on the other side of the mountain. Both were looking for ways to make the agreement a little bit more amicable. And after World War II, we see the Stenega Coke and Coal Company fully embracing things like mechanization. Um, and they start to begin the process of adapting their brand of welfare capitalism to fit the labor capital accord that comes about during the post-war years. And they start um, <clears throat> really sort of divesting from the company town model, but it takes other really, really unique unique forms that really do sort of set a precedent for the rest of the industry. And it, they, these sorts of practices do reappear uh, later on in the company's more recent history. So to understand what we mean by welfare capitalism, we need to look at the company towns themselves. Um, 
the Sonega Coke and Coal Company built up their company towns between eight, about 1895 and 1923. Stonega was the first um, initially called Pioneer. The old legend about how Stonega got its name is because it was close to Stone Gap. There was a sign that marked the Stone Gap and the P fell off. Now, I don't know about um, the validity of that, but that's the story that they've stuck to for about 100 years. So if I find anything that disputes that, I'll let you know. Um, after Stonega, you had um, Dirt Arno, Osaka, Derby, Imboden, um, Exeter. There ended up being about eight or 10 of these towns built. Um, Derby being the last built in 1923, and it, along with Stonega, sort of become the model towns for the company. These are the towns that um, the company brings dignitaries, other operators to, and they're the ones that are kept in the best condition. Um, conditions did vary with these um, company towns, but in Stonega and Derby in particular, that's where you find the most shall we say, amenities, the most um, facilities meant to keep miners and more importantly, miners' families content. So this is a photo of Derby uh, circa 1930, um, taken from the Hagley Digital Archive. And if you go to Derby today, I actually went um, with Professor McKnight's class this past um, this past weekend, and that sort of helped me get prepared for my talk today. Um, you'll see a lot of these same buildings, but there will be a couple of notable absences. So over here, you see the Derby United Methodist Church. Um, as a note, the Derby United Methodist Church, or, um, if you're a Methodist, this will definitely stick out to you. Um, has a full immersion baptismal tank. Um, so that is kind of an oddity that reflects um, the denominational makeup of the congregation versus what the company brought in for um, their uh, religion. So next to the company um, church, you have the company store. Um, I believe this is, I think that's the school or the, um, the Boy Scout Hall, um, but these two buildings are no longer existent, but um, these, especially the company store, would have had a looming presence over um, the company town. And in addition to the company store, you have um, recreational halls, you have theaters, um, both with a stage and with a projector. Um, the company would bring in entertainment, including movies. Um, they would build parks, um, sponsor baseball teams, sponsor um, the Boys and Girl Scouts, um, provide for education of younger children. And all of this is within the purview of the company. All of this is within their management and they saw this as an investment. They saw it as a way to um, avoid a lot of labor organization. Um, by keeping the miners happy, by keeping their families happy, or at least if not happy, content, uh, they believed they could produce more coal and have a more productive workforce. Now, there are some practical considerations to building company towns, especially in the coal industry. Um, if you're aiming for efficiency, it makes a lot more sense to build a rail line out to um, where the coal is and build company housing alongside um, the coal face rather than having people live in the incorporated towns and try to commute in, um, especially in the early 1900s in Wise County, when the roads weren't necessarily that um, great and traveling the six miles that it would take from 
Appalachia, the nearest incorporated town out to um, the mines would have been really a good half day thing. Uh, so company towns have that sort of practical um, stipulation with them too. It wasn't always about squeezing every last um, dollar out of the labor force that they possibly could, um, though that certainly did happen in a lot of cases. Um, but these company towns and managing towns um, at the company level was also couched in this sort of progressive spirit as an article in the industry magazine Coal Age put it. Um, this is around the turn of the century when um, the progressive movement is really starting to go strong. And um, one of the things, one of the broader goals that the different progressive movements were trying to achieve was an efficient managed society to try and cope with the problems that industrialization in the United States had created. Um, so by trying to create an efficient managed society, you could, um, from the corporate standpoint, um, create more profit for yourself and um, at least um, nominally, provide for the uplift of your um, employees. So with the company towns, um, what does that look like? Um, well, in this, in this particular area, just like um, much of the rest of Appalachia, around the turn of the century, you still have a lot of family farms and people are living in various um, states of, um, self-sufficiency, um, it looks like poverty in a lot of cases, and to an extent, definitely it is, but one of the things we have to keep in mind is poverty is always relative. Um, so in part, these company towns are built to attract um, a workforce off of the farms and um, for want of a better term, domesticate them turn them into a um, compliant industrial workforce. Um, and the way to do that is by providing these amenities and providing for um, what the company advertised as a better standard of living. Um, and to an extent that was existent. And Derby, by, as it was being built, um, you had running water a lot in some houses in town, you still didn't have running water in the towns like Appalachia and Big Stone Gap. Um, so at best, some of the conditions, especially in places like Derby and Stonega, were at least as good as um, those that you would find in the accompanying incorporated towns. Now, of course, with the company towns, there's also a catch. Um, and I'd mentioned that the company used certain coercive tactics um, that were pretty common throughout coal operation in Appalachia and really the coal industry as a whole, but it's more about how they employed it. Um, they still use some of these same tactics like a yellow dog contract, which once you sign it, you're promising that you're not going to join any union and you're just gonna stick with individual bargaining for um, your condition, your working conditions. Um, the company store, of course, was pretty ubiquitous. Um, they utilized spies and to be sure they did utilize um, evictions and pay dockage and those sorts of things. But it was always a question of degree rather than what they did and did not do. Um, the the Stenega Coke and Coal Company appears to have been a lot more selective in how they employed these means. Um, importantly, you also don't necessarily have the same type of mine guard system that you have in Southern West Virginia, and you don't really have the coal and iron police like you do in Pennsylvania, which the operators of Stonega the Lysenrings and the Wences would have been definitely familiar with 
getting their start in the Pennsylvania anthracite fields and briefly setting up in Western Pennsylvania's bituminous fields. Rather, you have in um, the Stenega Coke and Coal Company, a small cadre of what they called special police. Um, rather than being um, this almost paramilitary force that um, the Baldwin Feltz mine guards ended up being, where the Pinkertons were, it looks a lot more like um, kind of a dystopian Mayberry. Um, so you're talking about um, folks who the people know they tend to be pretty local. They're deputized through the court system and the company pays the fee to get them deputized and keeps them on their payroll. And they have all of the, um, they have all of the rights and privileges of any other sheriff's deputy, but their authority is restricted to company property. Um, and in addition to making sure that there was no sabotage or anything like that, or um, in more severe cases enforcing the company's will, a lot of their work had to do with intercepting moonshiners. Um, there's one instance where these special police ended up tracking a moonshiner who had come over from Kentucky and actually killing him. And that was a pretty big, almost scandal in the late 1920s. Um, later on, when the union finally does get a foothold, the company ends up debating what they're gonna do with their special police because um, a lot of them actually end up with um, union eligibility and a number of them actually do end up joining the UMWA once um, organization really takes off. And the Stenega Coke and Coal Company doesn't really experience a large union drive until after 1933. Um, the success of their approach ended up combining with um, a UMWA, which was not really in the best situation itself during especially the 1920s. Um, of course, in the run up to Blair Mountain, it was distracted with um, the, what was going on in Southern West Virginia. And after, especially after 1924 and the quite disastrous Jacksonville Agreement, um, the company, the um, UMWA and especially John L. Lewis are really focused on keeping the gains that they'd already made. Um, the 1920s were essentially defined by reaction against unions throughout all industries. And the UMWA just took a beating throughout from 1924 until about 1933, um, both from companies trying to sort of push back against them insurgent movements um, growing frustrated with um, John L. Lewis's leadership. And by the time the depression hits, the, the mine workers union is really kind of on a precipice. So this is another example of, um, it's an interesting example of contentment sociology. This is a parade float. Um, from Derby, um, and it's really sort of interesting. You have a massive chunk of coal here. It's about one and three quarter tons. And you have to imagine like today seeing a, a massive parade float with that much coal and knowing how much of a driver the economy is for, or a driver of coal is for the economy, um, it kind of sends a particular message having a parade float like this. Um, and of course, you've got a little kid here. Um, by the time this photo was taken, child labor um, was on the way out. Um, but it really does sort of reinforce this is why you're here. This is what is providing for your standard of living, um, even if it's 
not explicitly saying that, it's saying that implicitly. And this is a view of Stonega. Um, and you can actually see how the houses are sort of divided up. Um, we have rows of single and duplex houses um, going along the road here. Um, as you look at these company towns, you start to see a little bit of a class difference as well. Um, so the largest, best houses were usually reserved for management, company doctors, superintendents. Um, general management tended to live in the um, incorporated towns, particularly the Poplar Hill area of Big Stone. Um, and the first, like, as you got into the row houses, you would see houses for foremen, typically with names like Quality Row. Um, their housing was um, typically better than the small little four rooms or the small duplexes that um, miners typically lived in. And of course, since this is still the Jim Crow South, segregation plays a big part in how the company towns are laid out as well. Um, conditions did vary. Um, whether you were a white or a black miner. And you were certainly kept apart as far as living situations were concerned. But once you were under the ground, it was hard to, it was pretty much impossible to enforce segregation. So you had white and black miners working side by side with each other. Not to say that racism did not exist. Um, it certainly did, but that sort of complicates um, the process of segregation and sort of enforcing it. So when the Union finally does arrive in Southwest Virginia, it's under the auspices of the National Industrial Recovery Act of 1933. Um, that, together with the National Labor Relations or Wagner Act of 1935, guaranteed workers had a right to collective bargaining. And this is the jolt that John L. Lewis desperately needs for the UMWA. And he launches their biggest union drive yet to achieve 100% unionization um, in, Appala in Appalachia. And of course, this included the Stenega Coke and Coal Company, which now that um, the right to organize is being guaranteed by the um, federal government uh, really doesn't have any choice but to accept the union. Um, so how the company approaches um, unionization, um, early on it does use selective dismissal and eviction of who they call, who they identified as the lead organizers, um, especially in strike situations. Um, but they, other than that, they sort of try to take um, a little bit of more of a distant approach, so to speak. Uh, they don't bring in mine guards or anything like that. Um, they even try to discourage um, special police from handling things, especially after an incident in two incidents occurring the same day, hours apart from each other on August the 6th, 1933. Um, one officer um, named Owen Clark got into an argument with um, one Bill Mullins on the, on the porch of the Osaka Company store. And the argument escalated to the point where Clark pulled his pistol and shot Mullins. Um, the argument was purportedly over whether or not the bituminous coal code um, required by the National Recovery Administration had been approved or rejected. Um, Owen was taken into custody by another special police officer named Jess Manus, um, who later that day um, had a confrontation with a union organizer in that same company store. And that argument resulted in Manus striking the man across the face and trying to evict him from the store. Now, both of these instances represented 
a PR nightmare for the company. Um, it didn't really look good, especially considering the Battle of Blair Mountain was still in fairly recent memory. And across, the, across Black Mountain in Harlan County, um, you had ongoing labor conflict um, that earned Harlan County the nickname Bloody Harlan. Um, the company realized that if word of this sort of violence got out and this ended up not being isolated incidents, it could be a disaster for them. So they tried to mitigate the situation as best they could. Um, Owen Clark ended up going to trial and was sentenced to 20 years for murder, um, ended up being released after about 10 years for good behavior. And he died peacefully in his home in, I think, the 1960s. Um, so management tried to discourage special police as union busters, um, although they did briefly consider um, bringing in special um, tear gas launchers that could also shoot shotgun shells. Um, they considered all options um, and eventually settled on utilizing the Virginia State Police whenever there was a labor disturbance. Um, they would call in patrolmen in their white cars and um, the, the patrolmen would keep the peace, so to speak. Um, one of the rockiest incidents came in 1934. Um, in August of that year, um, there was an explosion at the Derby number no. three mine um, that ended up killing about 17 workers. Um, there's actually a song about it that um, was recorded a few years ago in a musical compilation about the, um, essentially about the coal mining industry and life in the company towns and all that, but I digress. Um, the company, tried to blame workers for um, setting off gas that had built up. Um, their initial report um, said that matches and lit cigarettes were found at the scene. Um, the Federal Bureau of Mines report um, actually ended up partially vindicating the miners in this case. Um, it noted several um, different factors, including poor ventilation and poorly maintained machinery that was more likely the contributor to um, the explosion and recommended several different safety measures be put in place, um, more strenuous um, inspections, better ventilation, and it did recommend the inspection of individual workers to make sure that no matches were um, being carried into the mines. And the Derby miners who by this point were already 100% organized um, actually filed grievances saying that um, they felt they were being um, unfairly targeted when compared to, um, when compared to non-union labor at other, at other camps. Um, but with this instance, um, this sort of represents the low point in labor management relationship between the UMW and Stenega Coke and Coal Company. Um, the relationship did start to even out um, throughout 1935 into um, the later part of the decade. Um, there were certainly strikes that um, occurred usually around the time that the Appalachian um, labor agreements were being negotiated between the operators as a whole and the UMWA. Um, and by 1939, the union established a union shop in all independent operations in, um, in the Appalachian fields. And this meant that Stonega, who at the beginning of the decade had no union to speak of, they had to accept with some exceptions, unionization, um, union membership as a condition of employment in Stenega mines. Now, 
to sort of demonstrate the success that the union had had up to this point, um, by the time, by the deadline that um, the union, by the deadline that the miners had to either sign off their um, union checkoff cards or um, leave the mines, only two men refused to sign. One of them ended up leaving the mines entirely. Another one was um, made into a foreman, which was an exempted position. So I'll briefly talk about World War II before getting into how in the post-war, um, <clears throat> the company sort of altered welfare capitalism to, to um, go along with a changing landscape. Um, World War II um, represents the majority of the time that um, the Stenega Coke and Coal Company operated under a union shop contract. Of course, in 1947, the Taft-Hartley Act passed through Congress over a, Congress, over a presidential veto and um, essentially outlawed the closed shop. Um, the company experienced um, much of the same conditions that um, the coal industry as a whole experienced. Um, they were affected by strikes related to the captive mine controversy. Um, brief, just briefly, captive mines were operated usually by steel corporations and they provided coal to the specific corporation that owned them, usually metallurgical or power coal to run factor, factories and mills. Um, those had been left out of the Appalachian Agreement of 1939, and John L. Lewis really had his sights set on those, um, those mines before the United States got involved in any sort of a shooting war, which they eventually did in, 19, in December of 1941. Uh, they were also, the company was also affected by the 1943 um, work stoppage in which Lewis and the UNWA ag abrogated the um, CIO's no strike pledge. Um, so you have that going on, but otherwise um, there's a fairly cordial relationship between the union and the um, company up to this point. Um, the miners at Derby in February of 1942 offered to work a Saturday, which was outside of the contract and donate their pay to national defense um, as a gesture to um, exhibit their patriotism. And as the company hoped, it would remedy a problem that they had been experiencing with absenteeism, uh, people just laying out and not um, showing up to work when they were supposed to. Um, another um, Stonega local sent flowers to the widow of D.B. Wentz Jr., um, who had passed away from leukemia in the 1940s. Um, Wentz was a member of the board. He was a top executive in the Stonega Coke and Coal Company. So you have these sort of um, attempts at a friend friendly relationship and the sense that you kind of get looking at Stonega is the company treats them not necessarily as an adversary, but really, at, especially at the national level, a bureaucracy that they can sort of bargain with and sort of negotiate with. Um, now, after the war, the company starts to pivot away from pick and shovel mining. You have a little bit of that before the war. They actually looked into joy miners when the work stoppages in 1941, 42, and 43 um, started taking a little bit of a toll. But in 1946, they began <clears throat> construction of the Glenbrook Colliery in Harlan County. And this was a the first fully mechanized Stenega Coke and Coal Company mine. Um, they renovated some housing in Kiyoki, um, right across the state line for supervisory employees. Um, but from then on, you really start to see the decline of the company town model. Um, in the 1950s, the company starts to divest from this 
And since you no longer have the company town and um, by the late 1940s, the company is starting to, um, or the UMW is starting to implement its um, health and pension funds, becoming a lot more of a beneficiary organization and accepting mechanization as a condition of that, um, the com company tries to sort of tailor this to fit the emerging labor capital accord. And that brings us to Ted Lysenring and the Stone Egg Gazette. Um, Ted Lysenring was the son and heir of E.B. Lysenring Jr., who had been the CEO of um, the Stenega Coke and Coal Company from the 1920s and eventually retired in 1950. Um, he was, of course, from Philadelphia, went through the same prep schools that his family had gone through. Um, he was educated at Yale. And in about 1949, he sent a letter. He was probably put up to it um, at, by some somebody in the family, but he sent a letter asking if he could come down to Wise County to work in the coal mines. And Lysenring comes down to work for the summer of 1949, works in every one of the um, operational mines uh, up to that point. And by working underground, he becomes eligible for and actually signs a union card. So, the future CEO of the company is a UMWA member. And when he goes to take charge of the company, he's worked with pretty much everybody who is already working there underground. Everybody knows who he is. And there's a brilliance that goes along with that. Um, one of the things that um, I like that Pres Professor McKnight says, um, the company was really good at out unioning the union. So you have that link between company and um, the labor union in the form of Ted Lysenry. And one of Ted's ideas, I think it does sort of come, across, come out of this, um, though there are certainly examples of um, company publications prior to the Stone Egg Gazette. This is really one of the most entertaining pieces of um, I guess, cultural or material culture to look at, the Stone Egg Gazette, um, before the company started publishing this, they undertook a pretty broad survey of somewhere around two or 300 employees of the company and got their opinions about not just what they would like to see in this, but how they looked at the company towns and um, how they viewed their living conditions. And for the most part, they viewed the company and the union as um, positive, overwhelming, overwhelmingly positive forces. Um, they did mention a few things that could be improved, but there's a lot of really interesting sociological data that comes out of those. And they end up in the first issue of Stone Egg Gazette and for the next couple, as it goes on, they end up publishing a lot of those resp responses. Uh, even the ones that are cr a little bit more critical of the company. Um, so it's very much a tabloid magazine. Um, it's pushing a specific agenda, company positive ad agenda, of course, but they also involved their employees, the miners and their families in the publication. They had a contest, as you can see here, to name the magazine and they gave that um, gave a prize out for who picked the name that ended up being the winner. Um, they had a ladies section. They had a section where people would share recipes. They had cartoon strips, usually having to do with mine safety. And it was always impressing upon the miners that safety was an individual concern. Now you can kind of see how this is maybe moving a little bit of responsibility of the way uh, away from the company. Um, but it's really sort of driving that home, especially as mechanization is sort of starting to take off. Um, you've also got minor spotlights, letters from the CEO, um, letters from the district presidents. Um, it's really 
kind of a brilliant PR maneuver by the company in that it, it really sort of helps, you can kind of see how it could um, reinforce the notion that company town life isn't all that bad and that the company is actually listening to um, its um, people. And this is a page from that first, um, first issue. And it, it's basically tying on to, uh, again, the company used a whole lot of sociological methods and surveys, and they asked who their favorite entertainers were. Um, they asked what they listened to on the radio. Um, a lot of the responses were sort of generic preaching and what was then called hillbilly music. Um, now we would think of as country and Western, um, but they also talked about the Grand Ole Opry and you can see people like, um, you've got Roy Acuff up there, John Wayne, and these actors and musicians, or at least their um, personal assistants wrote back just generally to the employees saying how honored they felt that um, they had selected those people as their favorite actors or musicians. And doesn't that just make you feel special when you're hearing from uh, somebody like John Wayne is talking about how he's so touched that he's your favorite actor. Um, there was a series on the average Stonega miner. They used this as, uh, again, surveys, um, essentially talking about um, what the average Stonega miner looks like. And it's sort something like this sort of drives home the idea that um, you're part of something bigger, doesn't it? Like it sort of drives home this notion that you are a unit in this bigger machine that makes industry and makes the country work. And if you want to see this really blown up, the Southwest Virginia Museum actually has this as part of their Big Stone Gap Room exhibit. And here is when Ted Lysenring, who had been groomed for the position of CEO of um, Stonega Coke and Coal Company, went to a West a SCNC affiliate organization, Westmoreland. Um, by the late 1950s, um, the company starts, like I said, divesting from the company town model. Um, and this coincided with the population in the company towns and mechanization. It's not just um, mechanization that's um, leading to loss of jobs, although that certainly happens. Um, better roads and um, a bus network that runs from Appalachia out to the different um, company towns um, makes it to where, and of course, affordability of automobiles, that makes it to where the um, miners don't necessarily have to live at the mine face anymore. So you end up with a lot of them moving out to Appalachia or Big Stone, and some live as far away as Duffield. Um, around this time, the company starts selling off houses that are in good repair, um, usually for a really, really cheap rate, basically whatever you can afford, um, and demolishing houses that they can't sell or are in too poor repair. Um, they start closing off the down the company stores but not before one last little experiment in company store uh, man um, management and utilization. Um, Scrip is outlawed by this point, but the company in the late 1950s opened up the Andover Shopping Center. It was essentially a company owned Walmart, which is really not all that different from Walmart today. Um, so it was basically your one stop shop for anything you needed and you didn't have, it was no longer just down the street. You could just drive down and buy everything you needed at the company Roses, essentially. Um, it didn't last very long. It was um, the target of several break-ins, usually kids up to mischief. 
but even that became a little bit more costly than the company um, could handle. Um, the hospital ended up closing around 1957, though it did, the company did retain its doctor um, going into um, pretty well into the 1960s, and it kept um, the building operational as a clinic until the 1960s. And that hospital had been in operation since the 19-teens, and it was really the first hospital in the county. Um, and that's a big part of how the company was successful in providing so much. In a way, they did provide a lot for the, <clears throat> for the miners. It was all in the name of efficiency and um, enhancing productivity. But you can see how there's this argument to be made that the company towns did kind of get a bad rap, especially when you focus on um, southern West Virginia and eastern Kentucky. That's not to say that there weren't abuses. As, as I said before, the companies, uh, the Stenega Coke and Coal Company still used a lot of the coercive tactics, and there's still a lot of indoctr uh, indoctrination and a lot of really um, underhanded stuff going on. But management sort of paid attention to what was going on in the surrounding area and drew from their own experiences in Pennsylvania. And they decided rather than fighting the union, when it finally did came, when it finally did come, they figured out maybe we can work with them and avoid a bloody Harlan or a battle of Black Mountain or something like that. Um, and the company in 1964 merged with and adopted the name uh, West Borland Coke and Coal Company and remained active in that um, capacity with the Stonega division encompassing the Virginia operations into the mid nineties. And event after that, they pulled up stakes and they still operate today in um, places like Wyoming and Montana. So in conclusion, what I hope to do with this talk and what I hope to do with my research and my dissertation is bring Southwest Virginia into the picture a little bit more clearly. Um, while the Battle of Blair Mountain is certainly an impactful um, inc incident and impactful moment in American labor history, it doesn't quite tell the whole story. It tells an important part of it, and it certainly influences what the company is doing. Um, but looking at the Stonega Coke and Coal Company sort of complicates the narrative about company towns and it complicates the history of labor management relationships in Appalachia. And again, thank you for UVAY's lecture series for having me. Thank you for the center to the Center of App for Appalachian Studies for having me. And I'll welcome any questions that you might have now. All right, thanks Lloyd, we appreciate it. Um, we have time for a few questions. Do we have anybody in the audience with questions? I knew David would have one. All right, lay it on me, David. Yes, how would you uh, compare our contrast, uh, the, Stonega approach to labor with that across directly across the mountain in Lynch and U.S. Steel's uh, captive mine. I think there's a lot of room to really sort of compare the two. Um, one of the things I forgot to mention, um, Lynch experimented and U.S. Steel experimented with a um, company union, um, employee representation plan. And prior to uh, the union gaining a foothold in the Stenega company, they actually 
tried to adopt uh, an employee representation plan as well. Um, it never made it past um, Lysenring's desk, but if you look at the two plans, they're almost identical. Um, so you see them sort of borrowing a lot from what their neighbors are doing, but looking at the situation in Harlan County, um, where you have the captive mine situation, you have a lot of smaller marginal, um, marginal operators employing less than 100 people and um, seeing the union as a threat that they couldn't absorb, um, there's a marked difference in how a large operator like Stonega is gonna handle the union and how a smaller operation is. Um, now with the captive mines, um, they're an interesting animal, I think. Um, they, they end up sort of warding off John L. Lewis for a good long time. I mean, this is a, that's a um, debate that's still going on into the 1940s, um, but I think there's an interesting, almost kind of symbiotic relationship between Stonega and U.S. Steel just across the line. We have an online question. What about the other Stonega Company towns? Um, you said a couple were model towns uh, that were shown off. What about the others? Well, like I said, you had varying conditions. Um, certainly Stonega and Derby were kept in the best condition and those are the ones that um, are mostly intact today. I mean, there's a few buildings that have been demolished, um, but as the towns themselves started to dry up, um, you started to see some of the smaller ones like Oseka and Arno kind of wiped off the map. Um, and conditions in those towns were, I would say fairly comparable. Um, they needed to keep at least some sort of a baseline for contentment, but it's not really Arno and Oseka that they're taking other operators to, to show how they do things. It's not um, those smaller towns that they're bringing in loads of people to tour the mines. And that's an interesting thing that they do. They actually bring um, train loads of people in to tour the mines. Was Stonega as profitable as other companies at the time? I would say so. Um, it was, the largest operator in Virginia. And um, sort of by that metric, you could probably compare it to um, maybe not necessarily a cons consolidated, but um, it was the most profitable, I would say in definitely in Virginia, um, which would put it in the running to be one of the more profitable in the industry. I think we had a question over here. I'm interested in the corporate structure of uh, Stone Egg of Coal and Coke. Was mm -hmm. it owned by a small group or was it controlled by a small group and then maybe it later became a public company? What was it when back in, the, say, the 20s and 30s? It had shareholders, to be sure, um, but a lot of the a lot of the controlling interest was still the Lysenring and the Wentz families. Um, they brought in some people that they knew pretty well to actually manage the day-to-day -day in Philadelphia. And they brought in a lot of those same people, sent them down to um, Big Stone Gap to manage things on the ground as well. Um, so they, as a public company, they did publish annual, annual reports um, though a lot of that controlling interest still ends up being, it still ends up being kind of a family thing. Anybody else in the audience got a question? Do we have others? Okay, I think that's it for questions. Lloyd will stick around for a few minutes if you have something to chit chat with him about, but thanks a lot, Lloyd, for coming today. Thank you all for having me and thanks for coming.